There we go. Do you see it now? Yes, please. Awesome. Uh, um, I wish that uh, I could see you guys and uh, I could see your reactions. Uh, but it's what it is. Um, uh, I was asked uh, to give a talk about uh, the update uh, in talks and uh, how to deal with the critical uh, cases in talks. Uh, I know talks could be sometimes overwhelming, but um, um, uh, we're going to learn uh, a little bit of, uh, or some tools to, uh, to get you to the other side. Um, the first slide here is uh, just interesting uh, uh, painter. Uh, he's an artist and uh, he wanted to paint himself. That's actually all of those pictures are the same painting. He wanted to paint himself on a different uh, medication. Here's on morphine, here's in mushrooms and marijuana. And, and you could see how um, the reality is distorted. Um, uh, the, 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 the way they see the world is different, uh, uh, those patients uh, who are intoxicated. Um, and so is, uh, here we go. And uh, so is uh, the presentation of the tox um, patient. Uh, they present to you different, uh, in a different way. And unless you think about it, the lab or the sophisticated uh, um, management or knowledge sometime will not uh, be used uh, unless you really diagnose it. And um, not all the patients um, who are intoxicated, they, came to, they come to you and they say, we are intoxicated. And so uh, that's the biggest challenge here. Um, they present to you high on some uh, of the some sort of drug and you don't know what they are. Um, they came to you simply in a seizure, unconscious. Um, a child who were chewing on a, a grandma's medication, tons of medication, you don't know which one, um, that it's scary which one he got. Um, bottom line, the history is usually uh, unreliable. Um, a suicidal note or uh, whatever it is, um, you might not get a history and so you have to rely on other tools um, to get you to the other side and um, and please don't feel overwhelmed uh, the, the talks is um, uh, think about it as um, support you're supporting your patient um, uh, regardless of the exact medication um, if you try to read your patient um, to really think um, um, what, what is the knowledge that you need to have to, to really read your patient, to see the clinical picture in front of you. Um, and so in this talk, um, I'll, I'll try to give you some hints um, and I hope you uh, could enjoy the talk. Um, a lot of time we need to think um, outside of the box. Um, uh, a seizing patient who present with seizure could have a trauma, um, a fever patient with, you know, with confusion, you know, sepsis could come in mind, but um, uh, put, put in your mind um, some of the tox differential, um, and that's the only way you could uh, help the, the, the intoxicated patient or the overdose patient uh, by first thinking about it. Um, for that reason, we're going to uh, attack this uh, from another angle. I'm going to go with the vital signs, not uh, with the medication, because they don't present to you saying, I am this medication, please treat me. Um, um, I have this tox syndrome, please treat me. And so we're going to go from the other side, so you would, uh, uh, you would have the exact tools how to read the patient. So we're gonna start with the vital, so, uh, vital signs and talks. And um, um, just a review, um, uh, if we think a little bit why, uh, for example, the cocaine uh, or the sympathetomimetic will have uh, fever, um, those guys will have um, 
increase in their metabolic rate, in the basal metabolic rate. And when you simply burn more glucose, you have more energy and uh, with that you produce more heat. Now, why the anticholinergic and why the aspirin, um, um, uh, why the aspirin has uh, also high fever, we're gonna talk about it in the next um, uh, slides. Now, on the other token, the hypothermia, um, in overdose patient, the hypothermia most of the time are central. Um, those medications, they go to the CNS and they turn off the, um, the thalamus, they turn off the set point. Um, but, but again, uh, we're gonna learn uh, more about those uh, tricks and uh, each medication, what does it do? Um, this slide here, um, I'm not sure if I'm blocking you. Okay, so this slide here, you could see the, the mitochondria um, uh, membrane um, uh, building up some energy to actually produce ATV. Um, the aspirin folks uh, overdose, uh, they, they build up all the energy, but they do not um, uh, build the ATP. And so all of that energy dissipates as a heat. And so that's why um, it's a malignant. And I'm stressing on this point because um, of the management too. Um, please think of intoxicated patient or overdose patient as, um, as an uh, overwhelmed uh, liver uh, you've got overwhelmed uh, system uh, in that patient. You do not want to add more medication. And so um, if you have a feverish that you think um, that's an overdose patient, go with cooling rather than aspirin because aspirin itself uh, could be the cause. Um, and don't add to the mix. Try not to add to the mix. Go with cooling. Um, with anticholinergic, there is another trick here, and I think uh, if you understand this, it will um, solve a lot of puzzles for you. Um, if you remember back in medical school, the parasympathetic and the precangulinic and the postgangulinic, and there were both acetylcholine uh, receptor. Um, this one is nicotinic receptor, this one is muscarinic, if you remember. The sympathetic, uh, on the other hand, the precangulinic is acetylcholine, but at the end is norepinephrine which has the alpha and the beta receptors and so on. But we've got here a, a very uh, a special exception, which is the sweat gland. The sweat gland actually innervated by sympathetic here. When you're uh, scared, when you're um, excited, you are sweaty. But the end is acetylcholine. And so that's why in the cholinergic uh, syndromes, namely the organophosphates, you are, um, uh, you are wet. And so for anticholinergic here, you cannot sweat. And so um, you cannot lose heat uh, the way you should be. And so you develop the fever. And so it's, it's a different uh, twist to the, where the fever comes from. Um, and that's just saying the same thing. Uh, when you see the patient is wet, um, most likely the sympathetic is going on or the acetylcholine is going on. When it's dry, then you know um, you've got the anticholinergic um, uh, guys. Of course, um, you could be sweaty because you're stressed. Like the hypoglycemia is a stress. Uh, the sepsis is stress. Uh, a lot of, um, a lot of um, uh, heart failure, for example, patients, they present sweaty not because they're... Um, um, intoxicated or their overload, but because they're, you know, the steroid is going on, that the, they're in stress. Um, the blood pressure, on the other hand, um, you know the blood pressure is high in the sympathetic, again, because you've got the, uh, the beta receptor here cannot contract uh, the, the blood vessels. And so when they don't contract, uh, you've got hypotension in the, um, 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 in the beta blocker. You've got hypotension if you don't have, if you don't have calcium. If you remember again in back school, um, the actin and the myosin, you need the calcium 
to contract. And if you don't have that calcium, if you don't have that beta blocker, beta receptor, you're gonna have hypotension. On the other token, the sympathetomimetic, um, again, um, because they work on the beta receptor, then those guys here, they will contract and you're gonna have um, a reflexive um, um, hypertension. I wanna say that tachycardia is not uh, really specific. Um, a lot of things could cause uh, tachycardia and, it, and it's not gonna clue you into one thing or another, but the bradycardia here is, is, um, is a good clue. Um, about the blockers that we talked about, the beta and the calcium, you've got DIG. Um, it works on the heart, it slows the heart, and uh, you could have a, a bradycardic patient, um, um, they're intoxicated on DIG, and, um, and what makes sense here, that also the organophosphate. Remember, if you have a bradycardia, the first thing you do is the, you, know, you give them atropine. Uh, you want to block those acetylcholine receptors. And here you have a lot of acetylcholine and your heart is simply um, slowing. Um, if you've got a patient who's, uh, who you think he's uh, overdosed, and um, he has hypoxia, or she, um, uh, have hypoxia, um, then you've got one of those uh, two things. Either the patient inhaled an irritant to the lung, a gas and uh, irritant to the lung, or it is a late presentation of uh, some of the overdose that could uh, end up with pulmonary edema. And um, not a lot of medication do that. Uh, Aspirin do that, and um, some of the opioid uh, does that too. Um, so keep in mind, um, if they're hypoxic, either uh, a gas or a late presentation. Um, the blood sugar is also important of uh, the vital signs, and um, um, it makes very sense that you have either insulin or sulfonylurea. But it's very important to differentiate between the two because um, um, because the latter here, the sulfonylurea, it works uh, um, more than 24 hours, or, or let's say around 24 hours. And so you cannot discharge those patients. They need to be in, um, they need to be on D5 or D10 sometime uh, infusion all the time to prevent um, hypoglycemia. And hypoglycemia here is the killer, guys, um, not the hyperglycemia. Um, there is another clue here. Um, part of the uh, part of the uh, vital signs in tox is the pupil size, and uh, you're going to understand a lot of the pupil size when you understand this um, um, diagram here. Uh, you've got two uh, kind of muscles. Where is mouse? You've got two two kind of muscles in the eyes. One that is radial and it's radiate around uh, the pupils, and when those guys contract they make the pupils wide and so they contract when they when you're scared um, these are the sympathetic guys while there is a circular muscle here when it contracts it makes you uh, it makes uh, the pupils smaller and you want those when you're focusing and so here is the parasympathetic um, control going on and so again when you look at the pupils sometime you would know which tox syndromes um, you're dealing with. Of course, uh, the opioid, on the other hand, does not have a receptor here because the opioid worked up uh, in the CNS and it shut the whole thing and uh, the pupils is one of the central things it does. Um, you've got another thing also, which is the skin color. Um, um, I want to add that the hemoglobin, um, or let's say the heme itself, it's, it's a molecule that is very, very smart and very, very sensitive. Um, when you change a small angle of, of a bond uh, here or there, it changes completely its color. Um, and it gives us the color of our skin and the urine. And you know, when you have uh, bruises somewhere, you've got all the rainbow colors going on because of the heme, uh, uh, different metabolite um, that each one of those had um, their beautiful colors. Um, if the heme uh, and the hemoglobin uh, bond to the cyanide, it changed its color to a bright cherry, bright 
uh, um, color and you don't get the, uh, the uh, oxygen saturation that you want. Um, on the other hand, uh, on the other hand, um, we call patient uh, to be cyanosed uh, patients or cyanosis uh, one of those one of the two situation. And uh, please keep in mind, anemia does not have anything to do with cyanosis. If you have low hemoglobin, you're not blue. Um, and if you're hypoxic, also you're not blue. You're only blue if you have either five gram of your hemoglobin attached to CO2 or 1.5 of your hemoglobin, 1.5 gram of your hemoglobin attached to uh, um, uh, the wrong iron, which we call meth hemoglobin. Um, and so this is very important information here because if you see a COPD with a hemoglobin of 17 uh, who's blue, you know the, the total oxygen uh, content, um, uh, blood oxygen in, the, in, his, in his blood is okay. You know he has 12 out of 17. But if you have a sickle cell patient with a hemoglobin of 7 who's blue, you've got a clear you know, big emergency, uh, and you should ring all the bells here, because um, he cannot uh, live on two um, oxygenated uh, grams. Where is the mouse? Here we go. Um, uh, um, you also touch the patient, and if you see a funny rigidity, you, you see a clonus, and sometimes, not only in the muscles, sometimes you see the clonus in the eyes. Um, and that's a buzzword for you uh, here. Uh, what is this? And that's a buzzword for you here for a neuroleptic and serotonin uh, receptor, um, both in the exam and clinically. Um, um, neuroleptic and serotonin are usually um, a combination of medication uh, with a history of at least two weeks of use. They're, so they're not going to present to you with a suicidal note. Uh, these are not the patients who's going to come. Um, you don't know anything about their medication. But uh, a lot of time, the presentation is puzzling. Just and um, simply Google, guys. Um, you know, Dr. Google uh, could, uh, could replace a lot of us here, but not in the emergency. Um, uh, the, the, uh, is that a serotonic, uh, serotonogenic drug, yes or no? And Dr. Google will tell you that. Um, guys, I want to I wanna mention that seizure or uh, aggressive patient in tox, you should not add, again, uh, another drug to the mix. Um, I would shy away from um, uh, something like haloperidol, for example, or phenytoin, because most of the drugs, guys, are not clean drugs. These are the drugs that have uh, a lot of uh, receptor they're um, working on, and the safest way to go is benzo. So even if you don't know what you're dealing with, you know what to do for seizing patients. You know what to do with feverish patients. You don't. You know what to do with um, hypertensive patients. Um, and so, go by symptoms rather than syndrome. If you're, especially if you're overwhelmed and you don't know what to do, um, uh, you don't know how to read your patient. Um, look at uh, the patient's skin. If you see marks, then you know um, there is. Um, mix and most probably they're opioid um there is so you know sometimes uh, funny and sometimes very sad stories about the blisters and the skins um there's two things uh that is uh, famously causing a blister and um and it's so funny i don't know how and i don't know you know what's the path of theology behind it but if you take um uh, the fluid here and in, inside this blister um, is going to be positive for barbiturate. And so um, the uh, CO uh, poison patient and the barbiturate uh, poison patient, they will present with blister. And if they are barbiturate, somehow they take the barbiturate PO and somehow it show up in the fluid in the, in the blister. It's interesting, but I'm not sure if it's a uh, 
you know, you could use it once upon a time, but um, I know the forensic uh, people, they do. I hope that we don't use it in the emergency. And after that, I am hoping that the tough syndrome will be um, easy for you. Um, you know, just, you know, just going fast uh, uh, on the tuck syndromes, remember Matt at a hatter, as a hatter. Um, the hatter is, is, a, um, is, a, is the job for people who are um, uh, doing the hats for people and they were, um, they were um, decorating the hat with a lot of silver and mercury. And, um, you know, they would touch their tongue and they would, you know, they would decorate. <clears throat> the hats and they would get mercury poisoning and they would get um mad at the end of the day and so that's what the saying is uh come from uh blind as a bat guys not because they have a wide uh pupils mad uh blind as a hat as a bat because um the parasympathetic and the third uh, nerve, oculomotor nerve, when it's paralyzed, you don't know, uh, you don't, you, you don't accommodate then yourself. If, if you're looking at far and then you want to look, uh, you know, at something closer, you can't do it. And so you're blind. Those three here are very, um, you know, coming from the same thing. Um, dry as a bone, we, we said that when we, um, when we said, the anticholinergic they don't sweat and so they're dry hot because they don't sweat and so they don't lose their heat and so they're hot red because they don't sweat and they don't lose their heat and so the the the, the blood vessels under their skin try to vasodilate and so to dissipate some heat and so they're red um and so with that in mind i hope that uh that tuck syndrome, it makes sense to you. You know why now, if, 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 if a teenager um, came to you and they drank um, a funny tea um, or a TCA or antihistamine, um, which is, by the way, one of the most uh, common presentation in the ED, you know why they're tachycardic, you know why they're hypertensive, you know why they're dry and so on and so forth. Um, on the same token, why the sympathetic are doing uh, what, uh, what they're doing. Keep in mind, guys, the agitation and the madness and the whole thing, because we have norepinephrine receptors um, um, in the brain. Uh, it's a neurotransmitter. We have acetylcholine receptors in the brain. And so all of those are, are not just uh, systematic. They're also uh, central. Um, uh, um, the cholinergic here could be could be tricky. Um, you want to say it's opposite, uh, uh, you know, just just opposite to the anticholinergic um, because they're they're wet all over, they're saliving like cremation and GI and the whole thing. And the killer bee is one of them. You've got a killer bee because you're bradycardic, the acetylcholine guys, um, the the bronchospasm and the bronchorrhea because you, again you've got a lot of juices that you know squirting uh, you know everywhere but um but i want to say all of those is because of the muscarinic receptor um the caveat here the acetylcholine if you remember with the uh, pregangalinic is also a nicotinic receptor and there is another receptor here um that could clue you into this syndrome exactly and only uh this syndrome which is the weakness and the vesiculation, because there is a nicotinic receptor in the motor and plate, that it's not sympathetic, not parasympathetic, it's in the motor and plate, and so you get weak and um, you get some vesiculation with the uh, cholinergic. Um, and that's what you're trying to avoid, by the way, when you're treating. Um, you're treating to until they are dry uh, from the bronchorrhea, but um, you do not want them to be paralyzed. That's um, you have to know also what is your goal when you're treating them. Um, the sedative here, uh, you know, when you know when they have when they when everything is down. But the difference between uh, the benzos and the opioid here is again the meiosis. The opio the sedative uh, benzos they don't uh, constrict the pupils. Um, I've got. 
I've got uh, four slides that it's outside the tox syndromes in a very, um, um, very short way. I want to tell you about the caustic um, injury, guys. Um, I want you to remember, I want you to really remember why when we have a brain infarct, we've got a liquefaction um, uh, necrosis in the brain and then it's empty out. And, and you see the CT, uh, you know, with, with the, all the space. But, but when you've got infarction in the heart, you've got a hypokinetic muscle. Those muscles are contracting and they're, they're not functioning anymore. And that's because this is more of a lipid uh, uh, in the brain and this is more of a protein. And, uh, you know, bear with me with odd uh, presentation, but I'm trying to, you know, to hit home here. When you, again, when you heat the butter, it goes wide, it, it, you know, it, it's just dissipate and it, uh, it liquefy. But when you heat the protein, it, it gets hardened and it gets smaller. And imagine and apply the same thing. If you, um, if you pour uh, on a skin or ingestion a caustic, they would do exactly the same. Um, um, you would have, um, because of the protein and the contraction, you would have a chronic constrictor in the, in the, in the esophageal um, chronically after the caustic ingestion. Um, and so here, try not to put a base on the acid or acid in the base. No, we are trying not to, uh, uh, no harm, right? First, no harm. And um, we're trying to minimize our losses here. And so, um, assess the damage and um, irrigate and go on. Um, one caveat in the aspirin here, the aspirin guys, uh, they present with mixed metabolic uh, picture. It's so funny VBG, sometimes the pH is normal, uh, but they have very funny VBG, metabolic acidosis, respiratory alkalosis, they have fever, and you look at the pH, you think it's normal, and you say, ah, oh, they're sepsis. Guys, they're not sepsis. And um, um, think, um, um, again, um, another caveat about uh, the, the iron. Um, the iron, uh, the presentation is a trick here. If they present early, you could see it in the x-ray. And that's the only importance of this, that you could actually give them um, uh, go lightly as uh, um, as uh, um, gastric uh, cleaning or gastric lavage, not lavage. Um, um, help me here. Um, the other presentation for the kids, the babies, um, when they present, um, we get a lot of calls. The the baby is chewing on a grandma's uh, uh, or on mommy's. Um, prenatal vitamins and they have iron, but they're being in the emergency for six hours, they're feeding, they're playing, they're, you know, they're, they're not complaining of anything. Um, please be in mind that nobody could take iron of a significant dose and have a normal stomach. The iron is so, so, so irritant for the stomach. So babies who are been there for six hours and they're eating fine. They're not. Uh, they're not uh, overdose um, on iron. You can discharge them uh, safely, and you know uh, obviously the treatment of uh, of the iron diproxamine. Now, one more word about um, opioid. Um, uh, I'm hoping that we all um, had this oath uh, once upon a time, and we said. Um, uh, we said we don't we don't uh, judge them. Um, we said we uh, you know القريب والبعيد والصالح والخاطئ والصادق والعدو. We don't judge uh, uh, those patients, okay? And so in the ED, uh, I'm not gonna hold uh, um, an opioid for a sickler because I think he is addict. If you think he's an addict, refer him to the addiction medicine, okay? If you think he's an addict, you can give him IV in your ID, in your ED, with, with a good monitor. You have the naloxone, but do not discharge them on uh, Tylenol-3 or Tramadol or any POs. Uh, but do not, uh, you know, give them a life lesson by, you know, watching them in pain. Not just the secular, any, um, anyone who says they're in pain. If you believe them, 
um, give them if you do not believe them, give them and then refer them to the addiction medicine um, if you have one. Um, Sometime, very rarely, you're gonna need a surgeon for some toxicology cases. And um, remember that x-ray in the iron uh, um, slide, uh, there was chunk of iron in the stomach and sometime the surgeon would take it away. And the other um, uh, case is the body packer. Um, these, are, uh, these are people who are usually clean. They are not using the, the medication. They, are, they pack their body with a huge commercial amount uh, with drugs that are illegal. And uh, sometimes they are caught in the court. Uh, I mean, in the airport or in, in any port. <clears throat> and so those patients, uh, they should go to surgery because if one of those bags leaked, it's a lethal amount. And so you don't play with those. Uh, it's, a, it's a surgery uh, tox uh, case. Um, with that, I conclude and I hope that I add something to your wisdom. I am ready for questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bayan. Uh, very impressive lecture. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, really, uh, we have a question from uh, Dr. Aisha Al Hajri. Uh, just she would like you to uh, emphasize again on the cyanosis because it's quite difficult sometimes in the physical examination to tell, uh, especially if the in a patient with a dark skin or something. So, uh, can you just highlight again quickly what's the cyanosis uh, in physical examination? Um, when you see the when you see the blood uh, when you see the skin is blue and also when you take the uh, blood in an actually syringe and you see it uh, darker dark you, you don't see it uh, red as usual um, I, I'm guessing you're asking because you did not see one but uh, um, it, it doesn't it doesn't fool you when they when they come uh, blue they're blue they're really blue um, um, their skin color from outside and the skin and the blood that you take uh, uh, to, to, to the lab. Um, and usually the saturation, the, the, they read the saturation always at 85 because that color does not go well with the oxygen saturation. And so it's messed up with their um, oxygen reading uh, or auto sat. And so um, I'm hoping I'm um, answering, I answered your question. Uh, regarding, um, yeah, regarding when, uh, when patients um, uh, can get blue, um, I'm gonna repeat, if you had five gram of your uh, total hemoglobin that it's attached to CO2, tiny oxidic carbon, well, it's a CO, or if you have 1.5 of your hemoglobin um, having the wrong kind of iron, which we call, and we call this myth hemoglobinemia. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Bayan, regarding patient presented with bradycardia, you know, uh, and you have a high suspicion of uh, intoxication, what's your favorite regime uh, to begin with uh, in resuscitation area? Is it like atrobin right away or you will start with other agents? Um, um, with, with the bradycardia, I would go with uh, ACLS. I would go with the, uh, with the, with the normal protocol. Um, uh, if they're hypotensive, then yes, you would go with the blood. Um, if I'm suspecting uh, um, DIG, then they're gonna have a funny ECG. If I'm uh, questioning uh, the beta and the calcium, then the glucose should tell me. Um, and uh, I would jump to insulin in those cases uh, before the atropine. Thank you very much. Very impressive lecture, uh, Dr. Bayan Abdelbaqi, Senior Emergency Medicine Consultant and Toxicologist in King Saud University. We thank you very much. And now we move to our third speaker, our distinguished speaker, Dr. Hani Ibrahim, Senior Emergency Medicine Consultant from King Saud University and very interested in, uh, res in uh, resuscitations and ECG. I will say if uh, in USA, if they have Amal Matu in Saudi Arabia, we have uh, Hani Ibrahim. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Hani, the mic is...